Okay, so you're in a technical interview and everything is going smoothly. You learned everything you needed to know in school and now all you gotta worry about is impressing the interviewer. You guys chat for a bit and everything is going well, but then they ask you a question involving trees and your mind goes blank. Is this a landscaping gig? Did I apply to the wrong position? Am I that unprepared that I don't even know what the whole thing with the tree is? But no worries, you're not alone. We've all been there during our technical interviews with one concept or another. There are a lot of things that you need to know to successfully pass your technical interviews and get a job as a software engineer and without practice, it's very hard to remember it all. But no worries, I got you. Welcome back to the channel. If you're new here, my name is Jose. I am a senior software engineer who's been working on a lot of products in different stages of the software life cycle. I've also had the chance to interview multiple candidates over the past few years for multiple positions, including interns to higher level software engineer positions, which has given me a great opportunity to learn what an excellent candidate should know or at least be aware of before going into their technical interviews. So let me help you with some of it. Today, we're going to turn that panic during interviews into confidence by breaking down one of the most fundamental data structures in programming, trees. So let's go ahead and dive in. So what exactly is a tree in computer science? Well, to put it simple, a tree is a hierarchical data structure that consists of nodes connected by edges. So for example, here we have a tree representing an organization's hierarchy, right? So we have, for example, this would be the CEO. And then at the bottom, we have, you know, other C-suite executives and then from their managers and so on. So as I mentioned, a tree is a hierarchical data structure that consists of nodes connected by edges. So here we can see the nodes being represented by the people, right? So here in this example, the people are the nodes, but this doesn't have to be people. This can be values, numbers, letters, you name it, right? But in this example, we have nodes are the people specified here. And we also have edges. So you can think of edges as the connections between different nodes. And in this case, as the relationship per se of each of these people. So we have the nodes are the actual values and the edges are the connections between those values. The top node of the tree is called the root node. And if we think about it, it's like a tree, maybe like an upside down tree, you can see this as being the root and then each node can have multiple children for a regular tree, right? So we can have a root node and then that node has children, but then this other node that's not necessarily the root also has children. So we can better see it over here. We have the root node with Currently it's two children and then same for everything below this. So we have one node that has multiple children. So only the top node is considered the root node as this is where the whole tree spans out of. And then we have children that can be part of any node, right? Any node can have different children. So you might be wondering why use trees during interviews? Why are they even important or useful? Interviewers love trees because they can test your understanding of recursion, hierarchical data, and efficient searching. So as we'll see later in the video, trees are very, very useful when we need to search data fast, right? Instead of going through a whole array, trying to find our item, we can use a tree structure just to narrow down the specific searches that we need, making it a whole more efficient and faster as well. So to say the least, these are very, very useful, not only for interviews, but in daily life. I know that depending on where your position is, if you're starting as a, as a junior engineer, you might not have to interact a lot with custom different data structures that you need to build. But as you do go up the levels and as you do start doing more like architectural design or senior software engineering, you'll realize that these data structures and knowing the concepts become a whole lot more important when you need to do different custom things that might not come out of the box from the language or the different packages that are available. So let's go over some basic terminology that you'll encounter when interacting with trees. I really love this graphic because it shows pretty much all of the different items or different topics that we would like to be familiar with in a tree and that it'll make it a whole lot easier when we need to solve a problem because we'll understand what each thing means. So as we mentioned before, the root, it's kind of like the first node, right? The top of the tree is called the root. Each node can have different keys. So those are the values in different examples, those were numbers or maybe people, but the key is what the value that is stored within the node itself. Then as we mentioned, we have edges. These are what connect the different nodes. So we have the node, the edges over here. Then as we also discussed, we have what we represent a tree as or nodes as, we can represent a tree as a parent. In this case, this node L is the parent and it has three children, which are E, F and G. So we have the parent node and the children node, right? A could be considered also a parent and L could be considered the children or the child of A. And then that applies all throughout the tree. 
So we have the root as the parent of Q and R, and then we also have R as the parent of C and D, and C and D being the children of R. So in trees, we also have the concept of leaf nodes. Leaf nodes are any nodes in the tree that don't necessarily have children. So for example, here we have node B, H, I, and D as leaf nodes because they do form part of the tree, but they don't have any children, so they're considered leaf nodes. And if we look at a tree closely, we can also see that a tree is composed of just smaller subtrees within it. So for example, here we can see that this right here is represented as a subtree of the main tree. If we look at the, at the definitions of what a tree is, it has a node, it has its children, it's just considered a subtree because we're not looking at the root node, but it still has all of the properties of a tree itself. And this is very important to understand because depending on the problems that you're working on, you might need to do some sort of like divide and conquer approach where you might calculate a specific value for a subtree and then just kind of trickle that up the, the chain or up the tree and then just do specific, more targeted problems, which will make it a whole lot easier to solve the whole problem overall. So we have, just to run it back, we have a tree that has a root and a key, and every node has a key as well. So we have P, Q, all of these are keys. Then within it, the nodes are connected by edges. We have pair nodes that just denote the node at the top, and then we have the children of that node. And I guess the last thing that I forgot to mention, well, two things would be siblings. Nodes at the same level are considered siblings. So for example, here, A and B are siblings because they're both children of Q. And also we have the concept of the height of the tree. So a lot of times we need to calculate what's the maximum height, right? Because this will let us know how much we're gonna have to search or how many levels deep we're gonna have to search to find a value, right? So in this case, we can count it by the specific levels that we have. For this tree, we have one level, two levels, three levels, four levels, and lastly, five levels with this one over here. So in this case, if we were asked to calculate the height of this tree, by just visually inspecting it, we can see that the height of the tree is five. Awesome, now that we have the basic terminology of a tree, let's take a look at different types of trees, right? Trees, just as you see out there, you have a palm tree, a pine tree, and so on. The same applies to trees, and they have different use cases and different constraints and rules that apply to each of them. So, so far we have seen multiple trees that don't necessarily have rules to them. Like for example here, we know that they have some terminology, like what a node is, what the edge is, but we don't really have any specific rules for how many children the tree can have or a specific node can have and so on. Like for example here, we see that this node L has three children, whereas node R only has two children and so on. So now looking at the types of trees, the first one that we encounter is called binary tree. Binary comes from the fact that each node can at most have two children. So we can see throughout the whole tree here that each node has at most two children. So we can have zero, one, and two, but no more than two. This is what makes a binary tree a binary tree, right? And then we can do some applications and we can do some algorithms on it by understanding the terminology that not only is it a tree and not only does it have a, a parent and children and so on, but also I can guarantee that at most, each node will have two children. They can have zero, right? At any point, they can be leaf nodes, so they can have zero children, or they can be like, for example, five and nine over here that only have one children, and that's still valid. Remember, our condition is they need to have zero, one, or two children, but no more than two. And that's where the binary comes from, because, well, you have binary as in zero, one, zero, two, right? Then we have a binary search tree. So a binary search tree is just building on top of the binary tree and it has a very similar constraints or very similar rules, but a binary search tree is a binary tree with an additional property that the left child is always less than the value of the parent and the right child is always more than the value of the parent. So for example, here and all throughout the, the tree, we can see that Every value to the left of the parent is always less and every value to the, to, uh, to the right of the parent is always more. So for example, here three is clearly less than eight and 10 is more than eight. And then the same all the way, like here one is less than three, but six is more. And then the same here, seven is more than six, but four is less than six. So basically here it applies the same rules that we have for a binary tree, where you can have zero, one or two children, but no more than two. But then it also adds the extra property that the values to the left of each parent has to be less 
than the parent itself and the value to the right of it is more than the parent itself. So if we compare it to the binary tree, you can see here that for example, we have seven to the left, which doesn't really follow that pattern. So that's why it's just a binary tree. But in the case of a binary search tree, we do have to make sure that we're meeting that condition. And this is very, very important when we need to do things like searching, hence the name binary search tree, because when we need to search for an item, at every check, we can kind of chop down the tree in half because we know that if we're searching for a value that's less than eight, it has to be to the left of my tree or else my tree is constructed wrong and I have an issue here, but in a well-constructed binary tree, binary search tree, sorry, the value that I'm looking for, if it's less than eight, it has to be to the side. And we'll go through some algorithms, but basically if I wanna check for, hey, is one in my tree, I would check, hey, is one less than eight? It is less than eight, so I'm gonna go left and I ignore the completely right side of my tree. I don't even have to look at it because I know that my value cannot possibly be on the right because it's less than eight. Then I do the same here. Hey, is one less than three? Yes, less, one is less than three, so I can ignore the right side because again, if my value is less than three, it has to be to the left of my tree or of my subtree in this case. So I would go left and completely ignore all the side. And then lastly, I check, hey, is one less than one? No, well, oh, but, but it's actually the value. So we found it and we're good to return. So in this case, instead of searching through my whole tree, I just had to search one, two, three items. And then it helped me simplify, chop down my tree and find my item a whole lot faster. So this is one of the great benefits of a binary tree. But a binary tree has a little bit of an issue and we'll get to it in just a second. So the next tree that we're gonna take a look at is AVL trees. AVL trees are yet another improvement on binary, on binary trees and binary search trees. So a, a, an ABL tree is a self-balancing binary search tree. What does this mean? What, what do you mean by balancing? And this is maybe something that I should have mentioned, but a lot of times a tree can get unbalanced, right? So let's say that we're trying to insert items into our tree from a sorted array, right? And we have values from one to 10. If I'm starting from the beginning and I'm starting from one, I would insert my one as the root node, right? And I would have one, then I go to the two, and since two is greater than one, I would insert it to the right. Then I would go to three, and since three is more than two, and sorry, more than one and more than two, I would insert it to the right as well. And I would do the same for every single one of the items in that sorted array. So at the end, what I would be left with, it is technically a tree, but it would resemble more like a linked list because I would just have like a linear, search, right? Because I would have one, two, three, four, five, six, all the way to 10. And I would defeat the purpose of the tree. I would defeat its benefits because now I just formed the same as an array. So we wanna make sure that tree is balanced at all times. And the way that we do that is by ensuring that the difference between the trees is no more than one at any point. So for example, here, this is one. We see that at any point, the maximum difference is gonna be one. So what an ABL tree does is that it has some other processing within the tree to ensure that every time we insert something in the tree or remove something from the tree, it kind of shifts things around to make sure that the tree is always balanced still so that we don't have, for example, here, like another node unbalancing my tree or causing it to not be as efficient as it should be. So it has some pre-processing or post-processing within the tree itself to shift things around while still keeping the conditions of two children at most and the left always being less than the parent and the right always being more than the parent. So in this case, and this will not be accurate, but if we wanted to insert another item, we might wanna, like for example, we wanna insert, I don't know, um, 10 into this tree. Since we know it's gonna go here, well, we might want to start shifting stuff around and maybe move the eight up, then move 12 and 11 to the right over here, and then do some other pre-processing. If you're interested in learning how to actually do these transformations and rotations, as they're called, within an ABL tree or a tree of your choosing, then go ahead and comment below and I'll try to make a video explaining in detail how to do that. And lastly, we're going to look at B trees. This is not by any means the only four trees that exist. There are so many different trees that you should definitely take a look at, but these are some of the most important ones that I considered would be good to show and be familiar with, as a lot of problems involve these trees and their definitions. So a B tree is used in databases and file systems for efficient data retrieval. 
A B tree is a self-balancing search tree in which the nodes can have multiple children. So as we've seen before, for example, with binary search tree and whatnot, we could only have at most two children, but in this case, we have more things that we can add. So we can have per node, each node can have multiple values to begin with, which was not a case in the other trees. And on top of that, each node can have more than two children. So in this case, for example, we have 2040 that has 30, 30 and 33 as the children. And then this one has like three different nodes with their own values inside. The B tree is optimized for systems that read and write large blocks of data, such as databases and file systems by reducing the number of these accesses. So since we have data combined, that means that we don't have to go to the disk so many times and our programs will run a whole lot faster because we keep everything in memory and we don't have to like offset data to the disk and then have to like, you know, waste time reading back and forth from disk as we need to access the data. So in this case, we're still a search tree because it still follows the pattern. If we, if we take a look closely here, the items to the left have to be less than the value that they're stemming off. So for example, if we focus on this here in the middle, we have that, yeah, we have 30 and 33, but the value to the left of 30 are both less than 30 itself. So we have 25 and 28. Then the value in the middle, it's actually, well, the middle between the two, right? It has to be a value that fits between the two. In this case, it's 31 because it is greater than 30. So it's still meeting that condition, right? It's greater than 30. And then in this case, it's less than 33. So that's why it falls here in the middle. And then 35, since it's greater than both of them, it would fall on the right over here. So I know that was a lot of concepts and this is a lot of things to take in. So I don't expect you to just memorize all of this in one pass. Please make sure to take a look at this. But now let's go ahead and jump into some actual code and taking a look into how do we construct a tree, what goes into it, and maybe how do we even insert data into it in a quote unquote good fashion that will allow us in the future to retrieve the data easier. So let's go ahead and jump into some code now. Okay, so let's take a look at a simple example of a binary tree with Python. I know that a lot of people prefer Python. I was gonna do this in Java, so you're welcome. So let's go ahead and do it in Python just to, to please the crowd. Um, but okay, let's go ahead and take a look. So the first thing that I'm going to do is declare a node, right? I'm gonna declare a class that will serve as the node or to represent a specific node in my tree. So I'm going to go ahead and declare a class that's gonna be called node. And this might seem like cheating a bit. I have Copilot running, so it, it kind of tries to write code for me before I can even write it. But this is pretty much what I was gonna do. So we're going to declare a node, and in the constructor, we're gonna go ahead and allow it to pass in some data. And actually, I don't like the data name, so I'm actually going to rename this to um, value. But this can be anything that you want. I'm gonna go ahead and rename that there to, to value, if it lets me. But basically, as we saw in our, in our examples before and in the different graphics of the trees, a tree has, as I mentioned, a value or a key. So I'm gonna go ahead and put here, um, just to specify that this is the key in our examples. It also has a left child and a right child, right? Because I'm, I'm creating a binary tree, so I wanna make sure that it has at most two children. So I'm gonna set a left and a right child, and just by default, I'm gonna go ahead and specify it as, as none or as no, because right now I'm not specifying any value on it. Okay, cool, and this is pretty much all that we need to represent the tree, right? Now, on top of this, we are gonna have to do different things to try and insert data the correct way and whatnot, but in our case, this, this, is, this is all that we need. This is how our tree and how our binary tree actually starts. So I thought it would be cool to actually show how we can insert data into our tree and do it in a way kind of like a binary search tree, where if you recall, we're gonna follow the rules of, you can have at most two children, so zero, one, or two, and then on top of that, the child to the left is always gonna be less than the value of the root itself or of the node itself. And then the item to the right is always gonna be more 
than the item of the root itself or of the node parent itself. One thing to keep in mind is that in a binary search tree, it typically doesn't allow duplicate values. We can maybe talk about some ways that we can allow for this, but in a basic form, a binary search tree doesn't allow you to have multiple values. That means that if you were to insert a new value, you'll just look at it and see like, oh, that's already there. I don't need to do anything. That's it, like my, my tree's done. But if you were to insert a value, then we'll go through some logic to make sure that we insert it in the correct, in the correct spot. So the first thing that I'm going to do is to declare a function that will allow me to insert items into my tree and to it, I'm going to pass the root of the tree and the value that I'm trying to insert. Let's go ahead and close that bracket. And then I'm going to do the following. I'm going to check if the root is none, that means that my tree is empty. I'm gonna go ahead and just add a new item with the current value. Then I'm going to do a couple of checks. And again, I apologize, Copilot is just <laughs> writing all of this for me. But if the root is not none, then I need to check some values. Hey, okay, is the value that I'm trying to insert less than the value of the root? And if it is, then I'm going to go right, right? Because if, I'm, if my root is, for example, 20, and I'm trying to insert 22, I'm going to check, hey, is, is 20, my current node, less than 22? And since it is, then I know I can go left because this value is more, so I have to go right. And I'm gonna do this recursively. This is the easiest way to do this is by just calling this method again, all right? Like, I'm gonna check, okay, let me try and insert this to the right of my, of my tree, of my current node. So I would go ahead and insert that to the right. Otherwise, right, this means that the value is less than or equal. We're gonna go ahead and go left. So I'm gonna check over here if my value is less than the value of the node itself, then I know I can go left and try to recursively insert that there. And once we have gone through this, I can just return that value back or the root value back and that'll just pop off the call stack and eventually give me the root with a fully formed tree. And then the way that we do this is, well, I'm gonna go ahead and declare just a, a, a specific node. This is going to be my first node. That's gonna be my root per se. And then if I wanna insert an item, I just call root is equal to the insert root five, for example, here or root 20, if we wanna insert 20. And I'm gonna give you a second just to think about how this tree is gonna be looking after I insert 20. And we'll go through some visualization in just a second, but there we go. So insert 20. And then I also want to go ahead and just insert and just insert another item here. And I'm going to insert maybe five into my tree. And I can do this with specific values. Or if for example, I have something like an array, let's say I have an array of numbers. So here I can call like nums. And I have, I don't know, 10, 23, 5, 7, 12, 9, and 47. I can do this in a loop. I can just kind of like go through every single items over here and then just insert them to my, to my tree as such. Keep in mind that this is just a plain binary search tree right now. Um, I'm just inserting items, you know, depending on the value but it's not self-balancing. So if I have, as I mentioned before, if I have an array that's already sorted, that might throw it off. Um, but for this, this is just a simple explanation of how to actually use that. And let's go ahead and visualize. How, how does this tree look? So after the first iteration, my tree is gonna look just like 10, right? That's gonna be my, my first item because I, I haven't done anything. I, I just have my root as being 10. Then on the second one, I'm gonna go ahead and declare here um, where my new node 20 is gonna go. So in this case, 20 is gonna go here on the left. So this is what my tree is gonna look like after the second insert. And then on the third insert, we're actually gonna go and insert five right over here to the left. Why? Well, let's go ahead and go through this. So we set the first item as 10 and that's the root. Then we try to insert, right? We're gonna insert 20. So we go through our, over here, through our, through our flow. Is the root none? No, the root's not none yet. Okay, cool. So is 20 greater than the value of the node, which is, or the value of the root, which is 10. So 20 is greater than 10. So I'm gonna try and insert this on the right. 
Okay, so I'm gonna pass in the right, which at this point, the right is still no. So I check here, hey, is this no? Yes, it is none, or sorry, none in this case. So I just set my value over here and then return back. And now I have here that the item on my right, well, was set to this note that I had. And then boom, I just go ahead and return and we're good. And then for five, we're gonna do very similar, but we check this. Five is not greater than 10. So I go to the next one, five is less than 10. And I try to recursively insert it on the left of the tree. So I pass in the root that left, that's gonna be none. And I just return that value as the right, uh, sorry, as the left and then we just call it a day. So in this example, again, we're defining a simple binary tree in an insert function to add new nodes. This is just the beginning of what you can do with trees. As I mentioned, you can do things like searching. For example, let's, let's um, look at that idea for a second. If we wanted to search for an item in the tree, what would we do? I'll give you a couple seconds to think about it. Okay, I think you've had enough time. So basically, Let's think about what we would do when we need to search for an item, right? So if we know we have a binary search tree, we have a couple of conditions. It will have at most two children, and then the value to the left of the parent will always be less, and the value to the right of the parent will always be more. So what do I need to do? Well, it's very similar to what I need to do for insertion, but instead of inserting an item and setting it as the value of the right or the left, I'm just gonna check, right? Like I'm gonna do very, very similar to this. So I'm just gonna go through and I'm gonna check if it's if it's none, if the root is none, then I know it's false. My value cannot be in an empty in an empty tree. Otherwise, I'm gonna do some checks. I'm gonna check, hey, is the value that I'm looking for greater than the root of the node, um, or that the value of the of the node that I'm looking at? If it is, then I'm gonna recursively try and search on the on the right node. Otherwise, I'm gonna try and do the same on the left node, and so on. So Searching is very, very similar to inserting as you just go checking the value and then you can determine if you actually have the item that you're looking for. Okay, so to recap, we went over the basic terminology of a tree, what a tree is, why they're actually important and why you would use them in real life, what interviewers actually are looking for, which is more your understanding of different aspects or different concepts like recursion, how to structure data in a hierarchical way, and also different aspects of how to use trees to solve different problems. So understanding trees can make a huge difference in your technical interviews and your overall coding journey. If you found this video, useful make sure to like comment and subscribe and let me know if there's any other concepts that were not clear here or that you would like me to expand on on the comments below and i'll make sure to make a video as soon as possible covering those as well good luck on your technical interviews i know this is a lot that you need to learn but with practice and just resilience and little by little trying out understanding the concepts doing different problems i promise you that you'll ace all of your interviews and get that dream job as a software engineer that you've been looking for. Thank you very much and I'll see you on the next one. Stay curious.